All right, back here again. Chris Puglio from the Puglio Group Neighborhood Loans with my longtime friend, special guest, co-owner of GC Realty and Development and the very popular download, 20000 a month of Straight Up Chicago Investor Podcast, Mark Ainley. Thank you for coming. Do you realize how long it's really been since we really met each other? <sighs> Let's see, how old are we? 35 years, something like that. Well, it's a, I bet it's something, you know, it's not that, you now you just took it the other way. You took it too far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I feel older. So think about this. Like you came out of my radar. So I'm younger than you by two years. So you came out of my radar uh, when I was uh, a freshman and you were a junior and you'd have that annual summer party. This probably would get edited out, but uh, yeah. you'd have that party. And I, just because my friend's sister, Jill Petterbach, was friends with you, I got to go to that party. You know I was there. Yeah. I was kind of the kid, like, hanging out in, in the background. But uh, I do remember those parties once in a while would get a little bit out of control. And uh, I remember a few hundred people scattering into Centennial Park yep, when yep. the cops came. And uh, So think about it. That would have been 1996. Wow. So that puts us at... Tw- uh, 1996. That'd be 28 years? 96, 24? Yeah, dude. Long time. Now, we started doing business in 2003. I still remember uh, us sitting down at Hacienda and kind of craft before GC even existed. So that would be, GC started in September 2003, and it was, it was called that summer before, and uh, you were going to be our, our preferred lender. And yep. here we are 21 years later, dude. You're still our preferred lender. Yeah, and I mean, I, I'm grateful, appreciative, and, and it really has been, and I mean this sincerely, an honor and a privilege to see how you've taken GC from where they were, you know, in that moment, which was a difficult moment, um, to where you guys are at today is unbelievable. Um, you know, so part of that for the people who don't know GC, right? Um, you are not just your typical residential real estate company, right? I mean, you guys do residential, you guys do a ton of commercial your property management portfolio is is enormous. So, so, tell me a little bit about what makes GC GC. Well, I think we ended up in a bunch of different spaces, all in the real estate realm, sort of on accident to start. We so right now we manage fifteen hundred uh, scattered site properties and about a million square feet of commercial space, but that was all an accident. That was a means to the end. Uh, like that was the means to get the money to, to run a, this humongous brokerage you wanted to run. And somewhere along the way, I realized that uh, we don't want to run a humongous brokerage. We want to run a profitable or productive <laughs> brokerage with people I like. <laughs> um, I think a lot of brokers, that manage, I'm a manager broker, so I think a lot of manager brokers out there would confirm that uh, there's a lot of babysitting when, when you have just too many of the wrong people uh, with you. So I think uh, as we, you know, as the market crashed back in, uh, 06, 07, or 07, 08, and we were trying to figure out other ways. You know, I remember those first couple of management clients, they were, uh, hey, if, if this guy gives 50 bucks, that, that we'll put that towards the electric bill. Oh, we got a new client that this client will give us 100 bucks. We could, put, we could get a water cooler. <laughs> like, <laughs> and so that, those kind of, those, that we just kind of grew that business and we did a good job at it, the property management. Before we knew it, we had a, a couple hundred units under management. And I remember the day, uh, Brian's like, dude, it's a mess. Why is things going so chaotic around here? And, and I remember saying to him, like, dude, we managed 250 units and half a million square feet of commercial space, and we don't have a process in place. Like, <laughs> we're just doing it. We're doing it on the fly. And, and me and Brian were always really good at uh, making sure nothing ever hit the floor. So, um, you know, with the property manager, we got the the brokerage, we got the residential, we do the commercial brokerage too, which is pretty rare. And we kind of span both sides of that. We, we really specialize in the industrial side of things. And then we have the whole world of, uh, investments, which, you know, obviously all of our clients that we manage for are investors, but our uh, forte into the investment world when the market crashed is something that's kind of helped us just be better brokers and be better managers. Right. You know, in kind of taking this full circle on that investment and management portfolio, you know, as your preferred lender, it's been, it's great to see because those, those renters then eventually become buyers, right? So, so you're not only, um, helping out investors from all over the country who invest in Chicago. Um, but then you're also helping them take the next step of becoming homeowners also. And I've always, you know, one of the things that I always loved about everybody who works for um, GC Realty and Development is that a lot of times I'm getting those questions of so-and-so, 
uh, is renting one of our properties. They have a little bit of credit issues, stuff like that, but they want to know if they ever can buy. And the relationships you can tell with not only the owners of those properties who you guys manage, but the actual clients themselves who are renters and how much they respect GC. They don't look at you guys as just kind of the middle person to a landlord. Because I sit down with these people and say, listen, we know that you had credit issues in the past, but, you know, Mark mentioned that they want to put you on a path to homeownership as well. Um, And just seeing how you take care of people in the total package from renting to homeowner to the business owner who needs commercial space. Um, you've been able to kind of go back and forth with those renters and, and create so many more opportunities as well. Um, tell me about how, uh, you know, how do you manage the person who wants to buy while still servicing the homeowner that you're representing in being the property manager. You know, that's got to be a difficult middle ground sometimes to be where you don't want them to lose a renter, but then you got to put in, you got to not only find that person a house, but then you have to find them a renter also. So that way they don't miss any income. So, so tell me a little bit about that process. Well, I'll say it speaks pretty well to our screening process for the, for the rental that if, if we're able to get them to buy a house relatively soon, that means that we're putting, putting pretty good people in there. But to your, your kind of original statement there was, uh, you know, how we cultivate these different people into different areas of the company. You know, I, this took me to probably about seven, eight years ago, realizing the value of the pipeline. And the pipeline, uh, that, that sounds very cold, but th- these people will, are, you know, they might be a first-time renter. They're going to go and buy their first house, eventually maybe turn that into an investment themselves, or maybe even go buy additional investment property. So the people that are moving in today are going to be potential clients in multiple different areas in the, in the next decade. And I didn't, I didn't see that far down the road. Um, no different than uh, uh, any other realtor who's, uh, they have a 12 year old kid today. They're going to literally, if you're going to be in the game 10 years from now, they're going to be buying a house and that's, uh, you got to play that long game uh, for, for that. Uh, a lot of people don't play that long game. And that's why I think uh, it is important to uh, making sure generate and year after year, we keep growing. Yeah. And, through that, you have developed uh, one of the most popular podcasts um, for investors called Straight Up Chicago Investor Podcast, where you guys have over 20,000 downloads a month and growing um, people from all over the country. I know this because when they look to buy an investment property, I'm getting calls from international to California to Florida, all about buying in Chicago. Um so tell me a little bit about your podcast. How did that start? How did you get to this point? And where do you see it going in the future? Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, Strip Chicago Investor Podcast has been successful, but I think uh, you do enough things, you just get lucky sometimes. So timing is everything. <laughs> you know, we came up with the idea, and, and I, I thought for sure when we go search uh, iTunes, we, we'd find 10 other people with that same idea. And this was right before COVID 2020. We're about to celebrate four years. But uh, I thought for sure, and no one had it out there. Obviously, we, you know, we were always big fans of Bigger Pockets, which is a, a larger national forum. We always wanted to create content that, w- that was local. And at the same time of, uh, listen, we bought a lot of properties between 08 and 18. And I made so many mistakes as an investor. I always say I made $1,000, $1,000 mistakes. <laughs> and uh, do the math. And uh, we always try to add value to other people. You know, that's how we kind of bring people into our circle is adding value. I, I'm a big compo- uh, proponent of proponent of saying, you know, giving you something for free or giving you free value or showing you what it's like or giving you a free download that's going to add value to you. So you kind of get a taste of what it's like to work with us in the rest of the company. But the podcast, man, there's just so much information that's so very street level local. And that's what we wanted to do with that podcast. And we cover Chicago, we cover the suburbs, but uh, you know, originally we, we tossed around the ideas that there's 77 communities and do we just do that with the city? And I'm like, I'm a suburb guy. So we got, we got to, we got to loop the suburbs in here, but you know, we're about to celebrate. We just, we're about to celebrate four years. We're about to hit 300 episodes. And, uh, you know, we've watched people actually go through the journey of buying, of learning about investing, buying their first property, maybe even onto their second property for some people. We've, we've been kind of along and they kind of share us this journey with us. And some of those people we have on the show, but I just love helping people. I love helping, you know, I think maybe I'm getting old when I say this, but uh, I love uh, helping other people achieve their goals. Um, and usually when you do that, you, you can usually find a way to achieve your own goals. And, and to your point, um, 
you know, when I first heard you were starting that podcast and stuff, I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. It's a great way for sales and this and that. And then I realized, you know, the type of person you are who I've known since high school, right? And you have always been the same. And you are always willing to help anybody, even if that doesn't mean you get financial gain from it. And when you talk about your podcast and what you just said kind of resonated with me because I'm sure there are so many people that I've heard on your podcast or seen on your podcast or talked to you about that you're literally just opening up your network and your viewpoint is the better the person they should be in our network, whether we're doing business with them or not. And I think that has paid such long-term dividends for you where, where you see these you know, something indirectly doesn't give you business, but all of a sudden, six months down the road, it's giving you business just because of something that resonated with somebody else who you talk to, right? Because you are giving people so much knowledge on the different subjects you talk about. Uh, you know, one thing we always talk about is house hacking, right? Um, I've been fortunate enough to be a guest, talk about house hacking. I've done a lot of loans in that where you have that person who's buying that multi-unit, um, as owner occupied, starting off their portfolio that way, and then down the road, you know, purchasing another one and so forth. Um, so, talk a little bit about house hacking and and and, and what exactly does that mean? Because a lot of people probably don't know. Yes. So, let me uh, dovetail back. I think the buyer, the real estate purchaser, has changed drastically since you and me got in this business. So, from early two thousands to uh, uh, you know, right after the market crashed. I, I think a lot of the, the, you know, people in their late 20s, early 30s right now all watch their parents get their 401k or their retirement or their secure union job wiped out by, uh, by 2008, 2009. And they changed their mindset on investing in stocks and bonds and, and things that uh, different financial tools versus brick and mortar, uh, a place they could drive by, a place they could touch, a place they could uh, uh, manage themselves if they want, right? They can't just go manage their own portfolio and know what they're doing. They can literally figure out how to manage property within a, in a few months. Um, so I think there's that opportunity now. Um, there's so many more people that came in the last decade that want to help. Now, the word house hack only got popular um, because, uh, you know, a place like Bigger Pockets and and and, uh, and just people using that as their, their tool to buy the first property. So house hacking is basically taking a property and there's a couple of different ways you can word it, but you might have a two flat and you rent out one, you live in the other. You might have a two bedroom and you rent out one bedroom and, and, and do the other. Now for me, I house hacked my first condo, but it's technically me renting out my two bedrooms and me sleeping on the couch and living for free. That, that's definitely a, de a definition of house hacking. So, um, you know, house hacking is, is a way that you're able to, um, you know, get into real estate and maybe not pay the same amount that you'd pay if you're living even less than if you had to pay the mortgage on your own, if maybe in a single family, or if you're renting. And at the same time, you're gaining all the home ownership benefits of the taxes, the paying down your principal, you're 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 hedging your uh, your, your investment against uh, um, um, inflation, and you're able to get a whole bunch of tax write-offs against your W two income. So there's so many uh, benefits to just owning real estate, and then if you're able to add the whole house hacking uh, element onto it, that, that's huge in itself. I think I remember your first house hack when you were sleeping on the couch who your roommates were at the time, and then uh, some good stories there that go way back as well. Well, I was uh, I was 21 years old, and basically <laughs> my roommates that that were I'd rent to were it was a, it was a it was an open around door, however a turnstile door where it's just my friends that got kicked out of their house. <laughs> they need a place to go. So, yeah, man, I got a, I got a place, four or 500 bucks a month. Uh, um, and uh, and that's how I did it. And, and I would go through them. And it was kind of cool. You get rid of uh, them if, you, if they're on month-to-month -month leases, which they weren't even on official leases. So you got rid of them when you want. <laughs> if I got a girlfriend, I would get rid of them. If I, if I was back single, I'd bring them in. Like, so it was great. So, but, uh, yeah, no, definitely, uh, that, that, was, that was definitely, but that, that inspired me. So that I realized one night, I, I totally remember I was laying there, listen, I'll date myself here, Q101, just chilling there on the couch. And I thought, I'm like, dude, like I'm only paying like $80 a month right now. And that was with utilities and everything. And these, these I said, Yahoo's in time in my mind. These Yahoo's were my buddies, I guess. But uh, these guys are are paying for everything. I'm like, this this makes so much sense. Like, this is what investing in real estate means. And 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 uh, and that's really got me the, the bug of going and buying my, our next property. For the record. 
I never rented out one of your rooms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, you're not one of the hours. You're, you're cool, man. Uh, <laughs> However, there there were there were some moments at Alumni Club and others, uh, uh, any pasto uh, that uh, maybe we. We ended up somewhere, yeah. But uh, it was definitely, uh, like I said, it, it's been very inspiring to watch what you've been able to build and 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 to be a part of it. Um, well, I I, uh, I don't like using this quote as much because uh, it's it's got bad. Uh, some people don't agree with it, but I, you know, I read one of the early books I read was Art of the Deal by Donald Trump. Sorry if anyone's listening and doesn't like that. It's very controversial these days, but I read that, and one of his lines was is always about creating your luck. And when you're when you're adding value to other people and you're giving all that stuff, eventually things are gonna hit. And I always joke around. I always tell people, "All right, listen." They're like, "I'm so grateful." Like, I almost feel like there's a catch. Like, why would you tell me how to do this? Why would you connect me with three people? It's like, listen, this is what's gonna come of this. You're either gonna do one of three things: either A, you're gonna refer me; B, you're going to eventually hire me; or C, I'll hit you up for a Google review and that'll take care of that. Or in the best case scenario, you do all three of them. And usually people are like, "Oh, that's cool. I'll give I'll leave you a review." <laughs> and then right. uh, you start with that. Yeah, so for sure. And then. And obviously, the market has been ever changing, right? Um, we've been through, as you mentioned, the housing crash together, um, that 08, 09 period, the the time where Chicago got close to getting the Olympics, which, which I remember you guys were gearing up, trying to get a lot of properties in those areas, um, to total mayhem, COVID now to a high rate environment now, right? So on those investors right now, I know rents are continuing to go up as well, right? So you have you have increase in rents, increase in mortgage rates, increase in house prices. It's really the, the triple crown of uh, difficulties for consumers. Um, so would you have somebody who's just about to get into investing? You say, and they come in and say, how can I buy an investment property right now at higher interest rates and still be cash flow positive? What do you talk to those investors about to say, now is still a great time to get an investment property? Well, I think uh, all those different times you described just end up being this adjustment period. And you got the new norm. It's an adjustment period to get to like people being okay with that new norm. And that usually takes about a year, I think. So your interest rates go up. Finally, now people are, you know, about a year later, people are just like, okay, I'll, I'll figure this out because they have to. They, they weren't coming back down. They're not going to go back down. They're not going to fly down as low as they want to. But, you know, for on the investment side of things, a interest rate is just a fixed cost. Like no different than if you're going to buy a property at higher taxes or it's got a boiler. So you have to plan for X amount of costs uh, for this. Now you have to find the right property. Your purchase price becomes that much more crucial. But you get the other thing that in that adjustment period is not just the buyer's expectations, but the seller's expectations, too. So uh, sellers might not be able to get that number they want because now this new buyer is coming in uh, with their fixed costs and they're running the numbers and they realize they can't pay that much. So that adjustment period includes both buyer and seller. But I think there's, listen, there's a lot of people that in 2018 were not buying stuff because they were waiting for the market to crash again. <laughs> and I remember I used to tell them all, like, listen, you got money in your bank, the market's not going to crash for just that reason. In 2008, we were all in. Like, I was walking away from the closing table with, with $10,000 on purchases, and, and I had, like, 110% uh, debt to loan ratios. Like, that's why the market crashed. You have cash. This guy has cash. Everyone has cash right now. The market's not going anywhere. So buy stuff. So all those people that sat on the sidelines 2018 are kicking themselves in the butt for it's like, man, I'll, they would have had huge upside uh, between the inflation and all that. But I think right now, if you're looking to buy an investment property, it's not going to get any better. What are you waiting for is always kind of the question because right now the housing shortage is there. That's not changing. It's not like they're, you know, when I, in 2005, when I bought my first property, I bought in a subdivision that was building 1,100 homes. These big builders, they may build 120 at most right now because they're afraid. They're afraid to get in the same situation they did before. So they can never build as much as they need to be able to help us catch up, which means all the current. And now now when they're building this new stuff, I, I look at the stuff. I live in uh, St. Charles and 
I look at the stuff they're building, like a, a, a 25 to 3,000 square foot starter home. Now, they can't build them small either. That's the other thing. In order to um, uh, make money, they have to build them 2,500 square feet or bigger. So they're not building these 900 square foot, 1,000 square foot ranches we all grew up in. Uh, they have to build these big houses to make the numbers work. So that's gone away. Now you have the, uh, um, so now you have these price tags of these homes because labor wages have gone up, materials have gone up. Man, six, seven hundred thousand dollars for a new construction starter home. Who could afford that? No one can afford that. The, the, not everyone can afford that. That's not a starter home price point right today in 2024. So that means your housing stock, your your stuff that you are, you know, your, your uh, you know, three, four hundred thousand dollars. Like that's not all of a sudden your starter home price point. So people are renting until they can afford that part. So, so one, there's that demand for rentals. Now think about this: they've built so many rentals, so many of these communities, but those aren't the same. So you take a, you know, we're familiar with like neighbor, like fifty nine and uh, and uh, Route eighty eight. They built a few different complexes right there. Those rents are going for like three and a half dollars a square foot. So to rent a a eight hundred nine hundred square foot one bedroom, you're paying. Uh, you know, twenty five, twenty seven hundred dollars. Now, if you have a one bedroom condo in Glen Ellen or Wheaton, you're probably only paying fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars right now, which is really high off of a few years ago. You're only getting eleven or twelve hundred. So the people that you know these older rentals, there's still going to be demand because people can't afford the twenty seven hundred dollar one bedroom. So there's demand there too. And then think about this: if the if everything kind of keeps getting dragged up by inflation and these new these builder these these keep going up, it's going to keep raising rents because there's not enough rentals. Like all, we're, you're, there's like a, a wave to ride, I think, over the next five, seven years. I don't know where the wave is going to end up, but over the next five, seven years, things are not going to get cheaper. So if you're on the sidelines, find a way to make your numbers work right now. Even if you're only making a few hundred dollars a month on that rental, you're still gaining the other opportunities. There's, there's five levers. There's the, the cash flow, which people look too heavy at. Then you have the, um, you have the uh, principal pay down. So every month you're making that payment, it's going down a little. If you want to be fancy and you want to pay it off faster, there's different ways you can do that. We talk about that differently. Then you have the, um, the offset of your taxes or all the stuff you're writing off that's going against your W-2 income or your other profit centers that you're making money on. Then you have the uh, appreciation. It's just going up. If you look over any 10-year span, it doesn't go down ever. It might mess around here and there or you get a crash, but over any 10-year period in history, they're always going up. And then the... Uh, the fifth one is uh, the hedge against inflation. Uh, so it, it kind of ties in with, appreci- with appreciation, but the whole like you're, you're locking in that loan today for whatever we're at today, even if you're on a best property at 7%, like you're locked in. Worst case scenario, you refinance, you, you go down. Best case scenario, you're, you're hedged against the 9% where your, your money's earning now. You know, it's funny you mentioned that the 10 year period. I actually uh, did a uh, post t- earlier today where. I, I found some information um, on the National Association of Realtors website, which we'll get to them in a second, <laughs> where there's never been a 20-year stretch through the Great Depression, through 08, 09, different wars, where if you looked at any 20-year stretch of real estate, the average ROI is 4% per year. So when you think about that, you know, you might have the years where it goes up 15, 20 percent and then you have a correction that. But if you really are in this for the long game, and I think that's what people don't understand. Right. People always want to make the quick buck. That, that's the other thing. I, I'll cut you off there because I, I think that's the other conversation I have, with everybody. This is uh, if you buy one property here for the next 20 years, uh, like you, you'll be a multimillion over and over again without doing anything but just putting your your five for five to twenty percent down every year and, and doing that and paying them off like this everyone wants that quick flip or it wants that quick uh, million bucks man it, it just doesn't happen yeah and and uh, you know our parents generation i would say this and you know i was getting the uh i don't want to say argument but uh the, the forceful conversation if you will you know, we'll talk to to that older generation and they'll say, I remember when interest rates were, my first house was at 18% or, or whatever the number is. I go, yeah, but you, you bought it at $42,000, right? So the amount of money where you see they, they bought something for $40,000 in 1982 and sold it for $375,000, uh, you you know when we were kids, or, or and then they moved into their next house. You know that type of appreciation 
probably won't be seen again, right? Because where you're getting five times your investment overall. But when you really look at 4% per year over a 20 year stretch, right? Okay. Simple math, right? I mean, I mean, you're going to get a large return there. And it really, I view it more as sort of like a long-term savings account, right? And it's a way to give yourself a pension when you really don't, a lot of industries now don't have pensions, right? Where if you know 20 years from now, 30 years from now, you're, you're going to have four investment properties that are paid off. And you know that you're going to be able to get, let's just say, $2,000 a month from each of them. Well, now you have a solid retirement plan and a company such as yours that can handle the management side. I think so many people are scared of that, right? I hear the nightmares from my father-in-law about, you know, his duplex and Lombard and all the other investment properties they had. And they call him and he's very handy. Okay. Those of you listening here, uh, Mark will confirm I am not handy. When I need to do something, I call Mark. <laughs> Okay, other than changing a light bulb, which half the time I break those when I'm putting them in. Well, you call so, my guys. Let's clarify that. Yeah, if my so wife hears this, she's going to she's gonna jump all over me for letting you agree that I'm, ha- that I'm handy. It's, yeah, it's my team. Just, <laughs> yeah, you have the right people to put, it, yeah, to, to put in touch with. Yeah, I got a guy. I got a guy. So, so I think people get so worried about that side of it, don't realize that there's great companies such as yours out there that really take that pressure off of them. What is that? you know, uh, monetarily wise, like, like how do management companies, is it like, I've heard that, that management companies takes like one month rent per year or, or something like that. Or, or how does it work when you're managing a property for somebody? Cause I, I don't think a lot of people know that. Well, you know what? I, I think what we try to sell these days is, is two things, uh, peace of mind, which sounds corny and then their time. So all of those things, yeah, I, I own a property management company, but I always tell people, I always encourage people to self-manage it till they know what they're doing. If, especially if you got nothing else going on. If you, if you have nothing else going on, or maybe you just have a standard nine to five and you got some time at night and you got time in the weekends and you want to put time towards this rental property, do it and learn it. Because if you're, if this is going, if you're going to buy five or 10 more, it'd be great to know. And then you also know if your property manager is doing a good job. But then it comes down to maybe a guy that, uh, you know, maybe it's uh, someone like yourself that uh, no matter how, if you have an investor property, um, you know, the 150 bucks that might, you might pay me on a monthly basis or 200 bucks or, you know, call it uh, $1,800 or a course a year, whatever it might be, you could go make that, you, you could go sign up a new person. Uh, you know, you can make that 10 times over in, in a monthly period in the time it would take you to, that you might've put into managed property. It usually takes about, um, you know, people spend about, I believe it's around on a non-turnover year, about 20 hours a, a, a year on the turnover, on, uh, I'm sorry, on a managing a property. So call it an hour and a half, two hours. But if you if you uh, take your time, uh, you, what you want to make divided by two thousand, that, that's your hourly rate. So if you have an hourly rate that's one hundred fifty to two hundred fifty dollars an hour, it doesn't make sense for you. It makes sense for you to pay me, do it, and 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 uh, it's just kind of like delegating it. Now again, if you're unemployed and living on your parents' couch and you're trying to get in this game, how you got the property? That's a different story. That's awesome. But uh, go manage it, figure it out, and that, that don't it doesn't make sense for you to pay somebody else. Um, so I think uh, the two things we we try to sell is that, that peace of mind and, and I'll comment here on the peace of mind piece. It's just like a lot of people, like you're saying, just are worried about that worst case scenario. Those worst case scenarios we, we've seen happen a hundred times and we just know how to handle it. And it's, it's just something that we'll, 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 we'll handle. And maybe when we get to worst case scenario, because we know how to ha- prevent it. Um, so we'll do that and then we'll give your time back. And that's really the service we offer because anybody here, this is a, a fun fact, I guess. Um, property manager, there, Property managers only manage about 35, uh, the numbers on a nation level, 35, 40% of, of pro- investment properties. The other 60, 65% self-manage. The, the value we try to add is to the people that want to come to the other side that want their time back or, 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 or cause here's the thing. This is what people do a lot. They, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to sell, but that's horrible. Everything we're just talking about, all the different things, benefits you're getting, holding the property long-term, like that's the wrong decision to sell because this last tenant just made you jaded. That's where you, you call and you hire somebody like us to take it off your hands and you've got to mess with it. And you get to keep your investment long-term and then ultimately take your, your $30,000 investment and turn it into uh, multi hundred, multi thousands. I'm glad you mentioned a couple things there. So, so the one thing is, it is changing the mindset of ROI, right? Um, I sat in a seminar and, um, the question came is if you put on a $300,000 property, right. And you put 30,000 down, right. 10% down. 
and you sold that house for call it three hundred and thirty thousand dollars, three hundred and thirty three thousand dollars, just to make it even, right? What's your ROI on that house? Oh, you made one hundred percent on that. You are the first agent to answer that correctly out of probably fifty I've asked. Well, that's because, the beautiful thing about it. The whole you get the leverage. You you if you buy ten dollars worth of stock. You cost you ten dollars, <laughs> right? You buy ten dollars real estate; it costs you eight dollars, or it costs you two dollars, <laughs> right? But most people will say, "Oh, I made ten percent on my house," because they look at the overall yeah. value, not the investment, right? So that's why I always say when people ask me how much should I put down, how much this, this, that, I go, "Well, there's a difference between c- comfort, right? What do you feel comfortable with compared to what are you looking to do with your other assets?" So whether it be your primary residence or an investment property, I know there's minimum qualifications for each one, right? But I would say if somebody has 15% down, 20% down, put 5% down if you can afford the payment, especially in lower interest rate environments. Right now, you might put more down because you want your payment a little bit less because rates are higher. But in those lower rate environments, how many people would come to me and be like, I want to put as much down as possible. Why? You're borrowing money so cheap. Yeah. At 3% at the time or 4%, even 5%. Most investment, you know, portfolio managers or your um, financial planners are, are usually getting anywhere from 8 to 12% return a year. And that's being conservative and conservative investments. So even right now, you know, if you can take money out of your house to buy an investment property, or you can um, use some of your assets to add to your portfolio, what you just said is absolutely correct. If you put $30,000 down and you double your money, that's 100% ROI. You ask our parents, they're going to say, oh, you made 10% on the property. Yeah. Right? And that's the mentality about wealth management and wealth growth that I think we have to change. Well, what I'll tell people, the people that, you know, the people that want to put uh, oodles down, they usually are more conservative people. And I say, I appreciate that about you, but put the, put this down, keep that money in your bank. And if you want to get aggressive on paying it down, maybe pay twice a month, you add an additional thousand, be aggressive in that sense versus setting yourself up right now with that cash is just gone. Because maybe you'll be aggressive paying down this loan for this year, but then next year you need that cash. Or maybe you find another opportunity to buy a second property even. Right. Yeah, and then also the tax the, t- the tax incentives are fantastic. You're writing off 100% of that interest. I, I mean, not only, you know, the management fees, you know, they should hire you. I mean, that's an expense on a rental property yeah. that even if it's costing them $200 a month, realistically after write-offs, it's probably only costing them 100 Yeah, so you do get the write-offs for that. And, you, and most people are not able to write off their time uh, that they're spending if they just are managing themselves, so... Another hot topic right now is uh, the National Association of Realtors and a lawsuit that came down that's affecting sellers paying buyer's agents commissions, okay? Um, I have a strong opinion on this. Uh, My opinion is knowledge is power, and as much as people think they're experts, um, they are not because I've been in, through enough transactions and, and it's different in every market, right? So you have some markets like Illinois where there, it's more of an attorney state where attorneys are involved. You have Florida, Indiana, some of these other states where the realtors do everything and, and the attorneys aren't usually involved in those transactions. And I know you have an interesting take on what you see is happening now compared to where it's going to go in the future. And love to hear your opinion on that because I know a lot of people, I'm getting three, four, five calls a week right now because people are saying, ah, should I, should I offer, the, you know, this incentive? And I'm always 100% say yes, right? Because my opinion is why would you limit your pool? It's subconsciously, right? We're both in sales, Okay. And this is what I hate about the ruling, the laws, and all this that they did. What I feel they did was they inadvertently made realtors have to choose between steering and not steering, which is against everything in our industry that they've tried to get rid of, including Dodd-Frank on the mortgage side. And I think this this stuff that's going on right now for the realtor side, I feel like this is your Dodd-Frank. Okay, where you had that initial 
crazy reaction. Everyone's freaking out. And then over time, it kind of worked itself out. Everyone figured out, well, it's not as bad as we think. And now loan officers actually make more per transaction than they did prior. Because before we would undercut ourselves, we'd be selling against, you know, you could upsell, but people think, oh, people upsell, upsell. No, actually we would undersell because we would have in our mind, well, I need to make at least $1,000 per transaction. That's my minimum. So I need to do, I'm on a 50-50 split. So I need to make two grand to make a thousand. Then you start to look at the, the margin of that and you're like, oh my God, that's a third of the margin of what mortgage companies charge today, right? And loan officers make double that, you know, or triple that on a transaction. So what is your opinion? What, what, one, take us through what you're seeing currently and where do you think it's going to go? Well, I think you're going to have a, a short-term result and you're going to have a long-term result. I think short-term, it's only going to make uh, the actual sale contract price higher. Cause I, I think what, what's going to happen initially is uh, buyers are going to come in, uh, ask, ask for a commission or ask for a split and uh, buyers and their agent are going to come in and uh, the seller's going to choose, have to choose, like, do I pay this extra 1000 on top of the 2% I only want to pay, or, or do I let this deal die? So they, they'll just end up putting in a price. So if you have a $200,000 sale price and, and they, there's $2,000 more they got working in it, they're going to do 2002 and, and they're going to credit back, they're going to pay the, the, the commission at closing. That's going to actually think increase prices. I think that's what's going to be our short-term thing. But long-term, and I'm not sure the time frame here, I, I think... I think uh, uh, brokers and the, and what happens runs every two years. Things change based on having to renew your license or not. People coming and going. Now, we're up for renewal this year, so I'm, I'm curious to see if this will have an immediate effect uh, actually as, as soon as this month, if people are just going to back out. But I think long-term... Um, you're going to have more. So on the commercial side of things, obviously we have the, the we have inside commercial, but commercial like we we don't have MLS like we don't follow those. We don't have all those same rules where you're listing it and you're, you're putting it on there, and, and you're waiting for another person. You literally get a listing, you send it out to your couple thousand people that uh, that uh, you have on your list that you already been building, and then you sell it to one of those people on there and you get a dual agency. <laughs> like so, all these firms have been so afraid of dual agency. I think it'll only increase the dual agency side because I think long term the listing agents need to create their own inventory, at buyers and sellers. So you're gonna have more of that. And commercials already doing it. Wholesalers, you know, wholesalers have to become licensed real estate agents. That's the we buy your broken homes or we buy homes for cash. The little bandit signs you see on the side of the road. They're already doing that. They're actually truly marketing. Now, I think what this industry is not ready for that is, and, and maybe it'll come generationally, is most realtors right now cannot explain why they charge 6%. They can't charge, they can't explain even their 3% or their 2.5%, however, whatever the split's going to be. They can't, and, and they can't explain what, what they're getting for the value. And they're going to have to get good at that if they want to charge that. Commercial guys know how to do it. Listen, we're going to charge 6% and this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it. We're going to get you more. Like They, they have a whole uh, a way of, of making sure that they know I'm going to sell your building, I'm going to sell it faster, I'm going to get you more money and so forth. Now, residential, and I, I, I think uh, you have a large percentage. You know, There's 30,000 realtors uh, in, in the Chicago metro area right now, uh, licensed, 28, 30,000, something like that. I heard something the other day that in, in the next 10 years, it'll go down to eight with all these shifts of how they're going to have to change business. But these realtors are going to have to go to answer that question and actually provide them that value. Um, and there's a lot of realtors, I was about to say, that basically right now they get the listing, they put on the MLS, and they wait for the other side to show up. They market themselves on, on social media like, hey, how, why do I have a great home in Naperville and all that stuff? But they're going to have to become effective marketers. And I think that is cultivating drips and building their 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 buyers list. Uh, and that's an ongoing thing, if you're, especially if you're working with uh, first-time home buyers. And then also being able to cultivate their marketing to that list. How, how, so you got to list the 2,000 potential people that want to buy uh, these buildings in, in Downers Grove. But how, how are you going to get that message to them? So you're going to create a lot of delay. So I, I think you're going to shift a lot. So a lot of the that uh, just kind of uh, put on the MLS and go away, I, I think that will go away. Um, and it's, at the same time, you're going to start... You know, Zillow, Open Door, all those guys, they're not, they're, they love this right now. Like, this is great. This, this opens up free games. So they're going to sneak in here and start doing little things that are going to, hey, you listed over here for 3% and we're not going to pay co op. And they're just going to, the, the end home buyer is just going to go there. And if the end home buyer wants uh, representation, they'll end up paying some sort of consulting fee. I, I think that's where that's ultimately going to shift long term. I'm a realtor and, and uh, I have a brokerage. I, I have 29 brokers. And uh, this, this, these changes will affect me as well, too. But I think, Really looking at what the next generation, this 
we've been kind of stuck in this this six percent or like these these rules around NAR for a really long time, probably longer than it should have been. So this doesn't surprise me that this is where we're at today. You know, I think it's also, you know, I work with so many agents, you know, across the country, and 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 there's the difference between same thing on the loan officer side, the the full time agent, right and the part-time agent or the part-time loan officer. And for too long, I've always said this, in, out of complete respect, right? And, and we just talked about earlier about how loan officers make so much more now per transaction because you have to state, because of Dodd-Frank, that you know on average in the Chicagoland area, you're getting mortgage companies pay anywhere from, let's say, three quarters of a point to one and a half percent per transaction their way, okay? Which means the company has to be making, you know, two and a half to three percent for overhead purposes, their split, everything else. And, and once this kind of happened, you saw the part-time loan officer not be able to survive because for the same reason, right? Just like you said, I, I think long-term agent compensation actually will go up. And, and I think that because you are going to have to add that value and understand what that value is. And, and how many people do we know both on both sides, both both sides of the business where, where I, I'm going to get my license and then when my aunt wants to sell her house, I'm going to tell her I'm a realtor. Right. And I'm going to make a little extra money for friends and family. And I think with these changes, I think that mentality is going to change. I mean, you've already seen it on the loan side with since Dodd Frank and even with rates higher. What you're seeing is you have your alphas and everything is kind of going more to team concepts because the people who don't produce at a consistent high level can't survive with how competitive it is. And I think the same thing's going to happen on the real estate side. The people who are freaked out and complaining about it the most are the realtors that do four transactions a year, right? Because they don't want to take a pay cut because they're banking on $2 million in transactions, which could be one deal, two deals, or four deals, right, in this market, and making their 25 3% on that one side, you know, and that's a lot of extra money. Um but as this continues to evolve, you're going to have to show how you add value, like you just said. Or, or the, what's going to happen is you're going to have these. There's a Brandon Turner owns the company Open Door, and I'm not sure their exact way they do it. They're actually buying stuff and do it. But you're going to have these di uh, discounts, maybe the wrong word, but a listing agent that'll come in and say, "Hey, listen, I will only charge you three and a half percent, and uh, they're going to pay two percent out for the co-op." and solve that problem and only keep 1% because in reality, they're not going to do much for you. So that's what you're competing with either. That, and that's where the people that, that the brokers explain their value, justify their value, and they're not buying it. There's always going to be people who are like, listen, I, no matter what, I don't see the value. And they're going to go that three and a half percent called, to, we'll just call it discount broker for lack of a better word. And, and they're going to uh, go through that. So I, I think you're going to create that uh, side of business as well too. Um, so I, I'll tell you, say this, uh, for you, I think you've always been very supportive of us on the marketing side when we come to you with ideas and all that. And I think any realtor that's going to make it in the next 10 years is going to have to up their marketing game uh, to, to, to buyers, sellers, and the actual marketing of physical properties. And that's not just posting it on social media and like, because you took a tour, like it's, you know, it's going to change. And I think, I think you guys already have the right mindset. You already have the mindset specifically uh, to work with uh, realtors you work with to be able to. Um, help kind of propel that marketing where you could kind of get both sides of it. And I'll make one more comment here for I don't want to forget this because I will. Right now in the commercial world and in the wholesaler world, you know, a lot of realtors look down at the wholesale world, but man, they are hardcore marketers. There's no part-time options. You can't be a part-time real commercial agent. You can't be a part-time wholesaler. It's a full-time thing. And that's where we're, we're going to shift to. We're seeing that on our side too. Uh, you know, it takes, I was laughing, you know, I always work 80 hours a week, but all for different reasons, right? And, and when rates are low, you're working 80 hours a week because you have to service your refi clients, but you cannot stop servicing your agents. And that's the biggest mistake people make on our side. 
And that's why so many loan officers, 61% of nationally of loan officers are now gone from when rates hit their lows three years ago. And why is that? You had so many loan officers just, you know, they do five deals in a month and each deal takes them an hour to input and turn in. And I'm seeing on Facebook, they're all at their pool, all doing whatever. Well, I'm sitting there doing events with you, going out, talking to different agents and, and, and I'm doing 20 refis while I'm still trying to get purchases and set up relationships. And the people who do not, And then in this market, you're working 80 hours a week because you have to because you're trying to capitalize on new relationships so that way when it turns or business picks up, then you can do that much more. If people don't have that work ethic, and and that's frustrating. You know, it's frustrating as a business owner, which which you are, as a a manager, and which I am. Um, And lastly, you know, and and again, I appreciate all the time that, that you've given us already, but I view you as you were out in front of this before anyone. I'm a, and I'm actually, uh, me and my business development person, Jennifer, is putting together a mastermind kind of little little mini conference that we're going to have in Schaumburg with one day that has different sessions and different speakers. And, and I'm going to be asking you about this and, and to actually speak on this. You were out in front of AI before anybody else was. I remember you came in my office talking about AI, and I'm like, Mark, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. No idea what, what, how this works. <laughs> okay. And then like two weeks later, I figured out my oldest kid was writing a paper using AI <laughs> and, and got, and I'm like, wait a second, you can't do this. He's like, what? It's great. I'm like, no. <laughs> um, so tell me how you have developed and used AI in your platforms to help give you an advantage over your competition? Well, this started with smartphones. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy. Like a smartphone in your pocket is basically you have an AI, you have, uh, you're kind of a cyborg in a way. Um, I think I heard Elon Musk say something like that. Like we're already kind of halfway to being partial cyborgs by having these smartphones. And there's different things you can do with that phone that will allow you to have an advantage over the person that either A, doesn't know how to use the phone the right way or doesn't even have the phone yet because maybe they still like their flip phone. I don't know, whatever it might be. But so we already had that advantage kind of going. Now AI is kind of the next iteration of that where it's like, all right, now we have our smartphone and we have this that we could basically skip steps for, I hate, hate saying replace people, but reduce headcount to be able to do things more efficiently and be able to spend money different ways. Um, and, and this is just kind of the next generation. That's not going to slow down. I think this is only going to speed up. Um, so you have the AI that, that, you know, so many people that, um, you know, are afraid of doing this type of stuff. You're like, this is the easy part, right? This is you, me sit down, talking real, your team here, that's uh, going to take this and do all these crazy fancy things and put it everywhere on the internet, 20 different ways. That's where the AI comes in. There's all this stuff that will cut down their time. Well, maybe even make them not have to hire an additional person because AI is doing all that stuff. The whole right now, I love uh, t- tying uh, my fireflies to my my calendar. Where right now, as you and me are sitting here, I have a, there's a meeting with a couple people from my team member that I I want to be at, but I, I have to be here. So now I'll listen to that meeting. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll show up with me on the Zoom and it will record everything. And then I'll and when I leave here, I'll listen to it. And I'll listen to it in double speed. So I'll, I'll fast forward the first two minutes where they cut out the, the intro and the hellos and all that stuff. And the last two minutes where they're just kind of BSing, saying goodbye. And I'll listen to the middle part for in, in double speed for 10 minutes. And I'll, get the, and I'll be able to get 20 minutes of my time back uh, from, from that meeting. And it's those little hacks, lack of a better word, but those little things that are helping uh, kind of take things to the next level. You know, the, you know we're, we're not good at wording things. or We're, not, we're very wordy. Um, uh, society these days. I, I read what I write sometimes in, in my first draft. And sometimes if I'm going to edit it myself, my second draft is literally half a mouth with a more clear message. We're getting bad at that as, as American. Maybe it's an American thing. I don't know. As humans. But being able to take sometimes uh, and have uh, what you write and have an AI say, hey, listen, give the same message, but do it in half the amount of words. Like that is, is huge too. Because um, people don't have time to stop and read stuff these days either. That's the other problem. We think we're getting our message across, but we're only pissing the other guy off on their side because... Uh, you wrote 17 lines when you could have got the same message in three lines. You know, there's three things you mentioned there that just make me laugh again because we went to school together. One, things used to, we were trained to be wordy. 
because our teachers told us we had to write an eight-page paper. Yeah. And, and we had four pages of content that we made into eight eight pages. Yep, yep. And then, um, and then the other things is uh, when you talk about our math teachers, right? It says, you need to know how to do this because – you're never going to just have a calculator on you. <laughs> well, what do you know? I have a calculator on me. I have four different types of calculators on my phone in which I can calculate anything. So I find myself yelling at my kids when they're doing their homework. Saying, you need to know how to do this. And I'm thinking of the back of my head, well, they need to know how to download the app. Yeah. And and <laughs> and lastly, the, the thing that, that we could laugh about now is – do you remember when me and you first both got the Nextel Chirp phone? <laughs> and <laughs> my code was three star two. So like, you know how they all had the, the different identification? Mine was three star two. So I, I, I love that. But uh, th those phones were the coolest and most annoying things all at the same time. They were awesome for the first week until I think I chirped you and you were on a date <laughs> and I didn't say, I didn't like lead in and wait for you to come in. I just let it chirp and bid like, like said some annoying guy to guy joking slip. And you're like, I'm on a date. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> and I'm like, these are the, I think the next week I went and got rid of the chirp phone <laughs> Uh, but they were still better than pagers, where you had to find uh, where you had to find a payphone to call somebody back, or we um, pulled over the, and the line at Addison Trail when we would need a ride home from practice, yes, and yes. you'd call collect and say, "Grandma, pick me up," and then hang up. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was, that was the, <laughs> so you didn't get charged. Yeah, uh, no, we uh, yeah the payphones. We we actually saw a payphone on a trip, and we I made my kids stop and take a picture and like I like hold it and, like just for fun because like you never know when you're never gonna see one again. Get a rotary phone and give it to your kids and have them try to use it. It's the funniest thing in the world. Make a video and put that up on your podcast because you will get a million likes on that thing. Just a phone that's plugged in blows them away. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? Uh, but obviously, you know, thank you as always. Uh, you, you know, thank you for your trust over the years. Thank you for your friendship, um, your family. You know, GC is my family, but, but you... Brian, you, you know, you guys have been there with me every step of the way, giving me opportunities, and and I hope I've been able to provide some, an eighth of what you guys provide me. So I just want to say thank you. Um, I appreciate you guys, and, and uh, I am amazed, not surprised, but amazed at the success that you guys have had. And, and I've told you this before, man, and a lot of people don't know our story, but Johnny's proud, man, and and and, and, and uh, it's been an amazing run, and I can't wait to see what the next twenty years. That's what motivates me when when it, when it gets hard. That's what motivates me. So yeah, no, I appreciate it, and uh, you know, it, you got to wake up, you got to do the grind, you got to do the, the hard things. Um, but when you're around people that uh, you like taking that journey with, it, it makes life a lot easier. So I'll, I'll thank you in return.